final lecture of the course on neutrino physics at this school. And um, actually, I have been moving with my lectures more slowly than uh, I planned to. And therefore, today I'll have to change a little bit the pace. I'll have to skip some material and go more quickly through some other material, and I apologize for that. Uh, unfortunately, there is no way around to finish um, these lectures. And um, nevertheless, I'll try to discuss some important details without uh, skipping them. So yesterday we discussed neutrino oscillations in matter of constant density, and we found that uh, the oscillation amplitude in matter of constant density, which is given by the sine square of twice the mixing angle in matter, is given as a function of density by this curve. Now, we found that if the MSW resonance condition, which is the condition that this term vanishes, is satisfied, then essentially what happens is that the amplitude of oscillation becomes equal to 1. This corresponds to this point here. And this doesn't depend on how small the vacuum mixing angle is. What does depend on this is the bit of this thing. But the value at, at the resonance doesn't change. And of course, we cannot go to the limit of zero mixing angle in vacuum because in this case, the oscillation length at resonance becomes infinite, which means that we cannot observe infinite the oscillations. Now, what is the meaning of this resonance condition? Uh, I wrote it here again, putting the plus and minus signs, which uh, correspond the plus sign to neutrinos and minus sign to antineutrinos. You see, it gives you some relation between the density of electrons and the energy of neutrinos, because the other quantities here are just constants. Delta m squared cosine of uh, twice uh, mixing angle in vacuum, these are uh, Fermi constants, these are all constants. So this means that if we have a beam of neutrinos of some continuum spectrum, <coughs> and uh, they propagate through a matter with some density, which may also be varying, then in principle for any energy, there will be some density for which this resonance condition is satisfied. Of course, it depends on the range of densities, on the range of energies, but in principle, it's not a fine tuning. So this condition does not mean any fine tuning between the energy and the density. Typically, for example, for neutrinos coming from the sun, uh, every neutrino energy will find its density for which the resonance of the uh, oscillations will take place. Now, if we consider neutrinos, not antineutrinos, so we, we have to, uh, to fix the sign plus here. In this case, the left-hand side is positive, so must be the right-hand side. And this tells us that delta m squared times cosine to, to theta, which can be written in this way, is a positive quantity. Only in this case, the resonance can take place. What does it mean? That if m2 is bigger than m1, then cosine square of theta should be bigger than sine square of theta. If we choose the numbering of our state in such a way that m2 is smaller than m1, then cosine squared theta should be smaller than sine squared theta. What is the physical meaning of this? You remember that cosine of theta gives you the weight of electron neutrinos in the state nu1. And sine theta gives you the weight of electron neutrinos in state two, uh, nu2. So the physical meaning of this condition is that the weight, the presence of electron neutrinos in the lower state should be bigger than in the higher state with a higher mass. And only in this case, the M's double resonance will take place. And if you remember that my discussion yesterday of, of the three uh, different mass eigenstates, we found that indeed, uh, the out of the closely related two states, the lower one has bigger electron component than the, the higher one. And this means that in the sun, for example, the MSW resonance should take place for neutrinos and not for antineutrinos. And this is exactly what we find in the experiment. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the resonance because antineutrinos are not produced in the sun. Okay, now what happens if matter density is not constant? I will go very quickly through this. But something very interesting actually happens. If we go back to the case of constant matter density, we find that at the resonance we can have a maximum amplitude equal to one of oscillation. However, to see the effect, we need the distance traveled to neutrinos 
to be very close to semi-integer of the oscillation length. So one half of oscillation length, three half of oscillation length, and so on. If, on the contrary, it's close to an integer number of oscillation lengths, we will not see any effect at all. So it's not enough to have the resonance. It's important also to have uh, the right distance traveled by neutrinos. If we consider the case of non-uniform density, density which is not constant, we find something really very interesting. We don't need this condition anymore, in principle. For example, if our density changes from a very high value to a very small value, like the density of matter in the sun, then you will see that irrespective of the distance traveled by neutrinos, one can have a very strong transition from one flavor to another. Let me try to explain how it happens. So, as we know, the tangent of twice mixing angle in matter is given by the off-diagonal element of the effective Hamiltonian divided by the difference of the diagonal one. And um, actually, uh, the MSW resonance condition is the condition that this denominator here vanishes. And if it vanishes, this would mean that two times the mixing angle in matter is equal to 90 degrees. We have a singularity for tangent. And uh, the mixing angle itself is 45 degrees, which corresponds to maximum mixing as well. Now, if we change the density from very small value through the resonance value and to very high value, what happens with the mixing angle? At very small value of density, this we, we just cancel delta m square over 2e. Again, the tangent twice mixing angle in matter is equal just to tangent of twice mixing angle in vacuum, which means that the mixing angle in matter for very low densities is equal to mixing angle in vacuum, as it should be. Now, if we start increasing the density, this quantity also starts increasing, and at the resonance becomes infinite, and then if we go above the resonance, it becomes large and negative, and if we further increase the density, it becomes small and negative. This means that actually, if we go from very high density to very small density, the mixing angle changes from uh, 90 degrees at very high densities because we have uh, very small and negative tangents of twice mixing angle to 45 degrees at the resonance and to the vacuum value at uh, very small densities. Now, consider the situation inside the sun. An, an electric neutron is produced in the center of the sun at very high density and this means that the mixing angle is nearly 90 degrees. We can express the matter eigenstate, the states which diagonalize the instantaneous Hamiltonian. Instantaneous means at this given particular point. And this is important because the density is not constant anymore. It changes with distance, and therefore at every point the mixing angle is different now, okay? as you see from this form. So we can express at every point the matter eigenstate, the state which uh, diagonalizes the Hamiltonian of neutrino evolution in matter, in terms of the flavor state. And this is just the usual formulas, except that instead of vacuum mixing angle, we have the mixing angle in matter. Now, at very high densities, as I said, the mixing angle is 90 degrees, which means that the electron neutrino essentially coincides with the states nu2 in the matter. The matter is the state 2. So we produce a state which is nu2. Now, if matter density very slowly along the neutrino path, the propagation is adiabatic. What does it mean? This means that we assume now that density changes so slowly that at each point, the oscillations occur as if they were in matter of constant density of this particular density. So the neutrino system has enough time to adjust to changing density. If this is the case, the matter eigenstate remains itself. Matter eigenstates new two doesn't go into the matter eigenstates new one. It just remains itself. It propagates uh, inside the matter without going into another matter eigenstate. However, its composition with respect to flavor state changes because the mixing angle is a function of the coordinate. Okay. So it, when neutrino propagate from, electron neutrino propagate from a very high density to the low density, it still remains in the matter eigenstates new two, but Instead of being always, always um, electron neutrino, it becomes a um, some uh, superposition of uh, nu u and nu e and nu mu, and 
at very small density, uh, the weights of mu e and mu mu in these states are just given by sine and cos sine square and cosine square of mixing angle. Now mixing angle in vacuum because we now consider neutrino to be at very low density. So if the mixing angle in vacuum was small, <laughs> this would mean that the probability of electron neutrino to remain itself is very, very small, given by sine square of uh, theta uh, mixing angle in vacuum. On the contrary, the probability that neutrino will become the mu neutrino will be large. This is for the small mixing angle uh, in vacuum. So, and it looks a little bit paradoxical because the smaller the mixing in vacuum, the more complete the transition from electron neutrino to mu neutrino is. And of course, there's some limit to, to this argument. And the limit is that I assume that the propagation is adiabatic. And if the mixing angle becomes too small, the adiabatistic condition gets violated. So we cannot consider uh, the limit of uh, mixing angle going to zero, for example, and have still com a complete transition from one flavor to another. Actually, what happens here is the so-called landau zinner phenomenon. The energy levels of neutrino flavor states in matter without mixing would be pre uh, like this. The electron neutrino um, energy level depends on density, linearly, and the muon neutrino doesn't depend on density at all. However, because of mixing, the energy levels actually follow this red curve and not this black dashed curve. Uh, and this is so-called avoided level crossing. And the state of electron neutrino at high density coincides with one of the highest states here, the red curve. And if it goes to lower density, it propagates along this curve and ends up on the branch which corresponds to muon neutrino, not electron neutrino, because of this avoided level crossing. Level crossing corresponds exactly to the M's double resonance point. It coincides to the condition with the condition that the two diagonal elements of the effective Hamiltonian becomes equal to each other. This is the meaning of the M's double resonance. So here we can show if we um, denote the composition of the matter against states um, with the electron neutrinos or with, with white and um, or neon neutrinos with, with gray, then you see that uh, the state remains new too, but its composition changes just an illustration of the adiabatic conversion. And the adiabatistic condition can be found and is given by this expression. And here L rho is a so-called density uh, scale, scale height. It tells you how quickly density changes with coordinate. So roughly speaking, this is the distance over which density changes significantly. So for, for the sun, for example, this is quantity of order of 10% of the solar radius. And we see that if the mixing angle becomes too small, this condition gets violated. Mixing angle in, in vacuum. Okay, and there's a very nice mechanical analog of the MSW resonance effect. Uh, it was actually, a mechanical model like this was projected, uh, sorry, presented to um, uh, illustrated the MSW effect by Steven Weinberg in 1986 at a conference at Berkeley. He just, very soon after the discovery of the MSW effect, he came to the conference with this device to demonstrate what the MSW effect is. So here we have two pendula with this weak coupling between them. There's a spring here which is supposed to be weak, a weak coupling between them. And the device is such that we can change the length of one of the two pendula. So it can be decreased and become equal to the length of, of another one or become even shorter. Now, if we kick one of the pendulum, of the pendulum, it starts oscillating, but the other one is nearly at rest because uh, the spring, the, the coupling between them is quite weak. However, when we decrease the length of this pendulum, what happens that at, at the time when the lengths are equal, they are at resonance, and the second uh, pendulum starts oscillating with the same amplitude as the first one, as soon as we reach the length of the second, which is equal to the length of the first one. Then they have the same eigenfrequencies, and they oscillate with the same amplitude. Now let's continue decreasing uh, the length of this pendulum. So what happens is that the first pendulum starts oscillating less and less, and 
the second one oscillates more and more, and at the end, this is nearly at rest, and this oscillates with the full pendulum. So the excitation is transferred from the first pendulum to the second one. And this is an exact analog of the MSW effect. So neutrino is transferred from one flavor to another. OK, now um, I discussed uh, oscillation in non-uniform matter, a matter of non-constant density. And uh, I did it in a very qualitative way. You can do it quantitatively if you consider the evolution of matter eigenstates. Of course, you should remember that at each point uh, in space, the matter eigenstates are different because the mixing angle depends on the coordinates through the dependence of the electron number density. And therefore, when you go to the matter eigenstate basis, you don't have only uh, this kind of rotated Hamiltonian, but you also have the term which contains the derivative of the mixing matrix in matter. And as a result, the evolution equation is given by this expression, and uh, theta prime here is just the derivative of the mixing angle with respect to the coordinate. In the matter of constant density, it will be zero. And one can solve this in the approximation when theta prime is small compared to the difference of the diagonal elements, and this corresponds to the adiabatic approximation which I just discussed before. And the adiabaticity parameter is actually just given by the ratio of the difference of uh, diagonal elements to the off-diagonal element. And this gives the parameter which I discussed before. And uh, I will not go into the details, unfortunately I don't have time, but the calculation gives a very simple formula from which you can immediately uh, derive uh, the conclusion which I discussed before that in the adiabatic regime going from very high densities to very small densities, uh, in the end, the survival probability for electron neutrino is just sine squared of the mixing angle in matter, and the transition probability is a cosine squared for the mixing angle, sorry, not in matter, in, in vacuum. The transition and survival probability. Okay, let me skip this. Actually, one can also consider the anti-adiabatic re uh, regime in which density changes suddenly. <laughs> and it's very easy to solve this equation even for an arbitrary dependence on, on, on density of electrons on, on the coordinate. And uh, this can be done by this simple substitution. And the result for the jump probability here, P prime is a probability that nu1 in the matter goes into nu2 in the matter, which is zero in the adiabatic regime, but not zero beyond the adiabatic regime. So for this probability, we can find a very simple expression like this one. But theta i. Sorry, yeah. may I question? What means prime, theta prime? How theta prime differs from theta n without Theta prime, prime is a derivative of the mixing angle with respect to the core. Ah, this means derivative. Derivative. Prime means derivative. Just derivative with respect to x. Well, uh, you have the uh, transparencies of the slides of these lectures uh, on the website, so if you don't have time to, to write something, don't worry about that. Okay? Just try better to follow what I'm saying that, uh, than to write down all the formulas which I have. You'll have a, an opportunity to do it later. Today, unfortunately, as I said, I have to rush. Okay, then uh, let me skip this also. Uh, this is in which cases we go to the vacuum limit. One is obvious that when the potential uh, in matter, um, in terms of matter is much smaller than delta m squared over 2e, but even in the opposite limit, we get the vacuum, expect, uh, vacuum oscillation probability if the distance traveled by neutrinos in matter is very short, even if the matter potential is quite big. OK, uh, there is a very nice and interesting analogy between neutrino oscillation and spin precession in a magnetic field. And you can consider a fictitious spin uh, with components given by the uh, amplitudes of electron muon neutrino and show that the oscillation can be presented like a precession and the adiabatic conversion, which I discussed before, can be considered like uh, the cone along which the so-called spin, flavor in a flavor space of neutrinos processes, uh, just rotates itself. Again, it's very nice um, illustration, but I don't have time to, uh, to go into it, unfortunately. Okay, now, if we consider neutrino, electron neutrino produced in the sun and experiencing the resonant enhanced neutrino oscillation, what can we expect to see for the electron neutrino survival probability after they exit the sun? 
Uh, so the survival probability is a function of the neutrino energy divided actually by delta m squared here is shown on this uh, plot and it has a form of the bathtub. It looks like a bathtub. Uh, and depending, uh, so the level of the bottom of this bathtub is given by sine square of theta of Nixon angle in, in vacuum. As I discussed, this corresponds to the area budget regime. Now the left, so uh, for small theta, is, the bathtub is like this. For bigger theta, the bathtub is like this. Now, the upper edge here, the left corner edge here, correspond to small energies for which the resonance density is very high. We, and it may not exist in the sun. If the corresponding resonance density, which leads to the MW resonance, is too high, such a density may not exist in the sun, which is density which is bigger than about 150 grams per cubic centimeter. And therefore, there is essentially no M's double effect in this case. On the other hand, for high energy, the adiabaticity gets broken, and therefore, uh, the survival probability again climbs up. So this gives us you the idea of the energy distortion of the spectrum of solar neutrinos due to the M's double effect. OK, here is um, the day-night effects. What happens if neutrinos are coming to our detector during the night? Then they cross matter not only of the sun, but also of the earth. And this has to be taken into account. And the probability of survival of electron neutrinos after they cross the earth and the sun are given by this formula, is given by this formula. But this is the probability of survival in the sun. P2e is a probability for the second mass eigenstate to become an electron neutrino upon crossing the earth. So I told you that neutrinos which arrive at Earth are not flavor states coming from a very long distance like the Sun, uh, but they are in the mass eigenstates. And we can express everything in terms of the transition of the second mass eigenstate into electron neutrino, because for the first mass eigenstate, by unitarity, uh, we can immediately get uh, the probability as 1 minus P2E. Okay. So this formula is actually all, also very easily derived. And here you will find the derivation. But again, I don't have time to go through it, unfortunately. OK, so another possible matter effect. I don't know if I should skip it. No, maybe very, very quickly. So the M's double effect is the most familiar to everyone, the resonant enhanced, uh, enhancement of neutrino oscillation in matter. However, it's not the only possible matter. It may be that even if the matter density is such that level crossing or avoided level crossing never occurs, still matter can strongly enhance neutrino oscillations. How can it happen? So you remember that uh, the M's double effect has a mechanical analogy of two coupled pendulum. Then, of course, a natural question to us is, are there any other interesting mechanical phenomena which can have analogy in neutrino physics? And one of them is the parametric resonance. An example of the parametric resonance is a pendulum with vertically oscillating point of support. So if the frequency of this oscillation is related in a certain way with the eigenfrequency of the pendulum, what happens is the pendulum can go upside down and start oscillating near the vertical, uh, otherwise unstable point of equilibrium. And the condition for small amplitude oscillation is just that the external frequency of the motion of this point of support is related to the eigenfrequency in this way. Now, how can we realize it in neutrino physics? If we have some kind of, for example, periodic density modulation, and the density may be very far from the res of M's level resonance one, still we can have a strong enhancement of neutrino oscillation. And one simple example which admits an exact solution is this one, periodic step function. In this case, some condition can be satisfied for which neutrino oscillation can be enhanced even if both uh, amplitude densities, rho 1 and rho 2, are very far from, away from the M's double resonant density. And what happens to the following? At density, at, in, in first step, uh, in, in a matter of constant density, we have normal oscillation with some oscillation amplitude, which is not close to unity because we are far from the M's double resonance density. 
And then if the density stayed constant, it was like this, then this curve would go down. The transition probability would go down. However, because density changes drastically here, the system, the neutrino system, forgets or can forget about the fact that it has to go down and continues to go up with other oscillation angle. And then so on and so forth. And that was the qualitative explanation. Now it's the result of numerical calculation, and you see that for certain conditions, this can indeed take the place. Of course, the question is, where can you find this kind of the density profile? And the answer is the following. This is the density profile of the Earth. And in first approximation, it is similar to this. Uh, you can neglect small changes of density within the mantle of the Earth and within the core of the Earth. And just take into account the jump of density between, on the border between the mantle of the Earth and the core of the Earth. So you have a part of density profile which is similar uh, to the periodic step function which I discussed before. And it turned out that indeed, for neutrino oscillation in the Earth, one can expect to have this parametric resonance enhancement. Again, I cannot go uh, into detail. This just shows that this MSW resonance in, in the core, this is in the matter, and this is a parametric resonance which may be much stronger than the MSW resonances. Okay, let me skip all this. This is actually the illustration of this uh, different resonance. MSW resonance peak, and this is um, the parametric resonance. Here uh, on the plot we have the cosine of the zenith angle of neutrino trajectory in the Earth, which gives you the length which neutrinos propagate in the Earth. And on the other axis, we have into the energy. So it's a very interesting structure of resonances for neutrinos propagated inside the Earth. OK, I'll skip three neutrino oscillations in matter altogether. And switch to the direct neutrino mass measurements. Now, the rest of the lecture will be a very brief review of the experimental uh, situation in neutrino physics. Uh, a very short one, actually, the shortest one was given in my first lecture. Now it will be more detailed, but still relatively short. Okay. Now, as I told you before, and as you know already, in neutrino oscillation experiments, we can only probe neutrino mass square differences. We cannot probe the absolute scale of neutrino mass. And of course, we want to know how big the neutrino mass actually is. And there are several ways to uh, um, actually attack this problem. One of them is the measurement of the spectrum in beta decay. So if we consider uh, beta decay spectrum, this is the figure we have already seen. Without neutrino, we would expect the discrete uh, spectrum. In reality, we see this spectrum, which helps us to understand that neutrino exists. And the question is, how much the spectrum depends on the neutrino mass? This question was raised actually by Enrico Fermi in as early as 1934 in his famous paper in which the theory of beta decay was first um, developed. And it was published in Scientific Physics for that some German works here. Uh, this is the zero neutrino mass close to this point, the end point of the spectrum of electrons. This is the small neutrino mass and this is the large neutrino mass. And you see that um, qualitatively the picture changes drastically, depending on whether neutrinos are massive or not. However, this only happens in a very small region close to the end point spectrum, uh, end point of the spectrum of, electro of electrons produced uh, in beta decay. Why is it so? Because when the electron energy is close to its maximum value, neutrino energy is close to its minimum value. The energy is shared between the electron and neutrino. And when neutrino energy is minimal, then it's easier to, to probe uh, the neutrino mass. Now the spectrum for the so-called allowed transitions, uh, electron spectrum is given by this expression for zero neutrino mass and by this expression for non-zero neutrino mass. Okay? Uh, now that this function f is called the Fermi function. It takes into account the interaction of the emitted electron with the Coulomb field of the nucleus. Okay? And it's a well-known function. So we have to study the spectrum to find out whether neutrino is massive or not, and if it is, uh, how much the, the neutrino mass is. And that's tough, because being close to the end point of the spectrum means that the statistics is very small, 
and since um, the energy resolution which we need is extremely high, the experiments are very, very difficult. So what helps uh, and what is very convenient is a so-called Curie plot. Curie plot is if we divide by the spec of the spectrum, sorry, divide the spectrum of uh, electrons by this quantity, and then what we obtain here is actually the square root of what is shown in, in violet, in different color here. In the case of massless neutrinos, it's just E0 minus electron uh, energy. And in the case of massive neutrinos, this is square root of this one. And you can see that the behavior of these curves is different. For neutrino mass, instead of straight line here, we get something when the straight line flows to the end of the spectrum, goes down. This is assuming that there is just only one massive neutrino and uh, then only one electron neutrino. Okay? So what happens if we have more than one? We know that we have three actually massive neutrinos. So we would have something like this. We expect for one mass this picture, for another mass this picture, and for the third mass, the lightest mass, this picture. And of course, what happens is that the full curve goes like this. So if you take into account in the formula for the electron spectrum that there are three different uh, mass against the three different um, values, mass values, uh, you would expect to see this kind of spectrum close to the end point of the electron spectrum in beta decay. However, to see this, you need an extremely good energy resolution which we don't have. So there is no hope, unfortunately, to see this beautiful structure. What we measure instead is some effective mass which is given by this formula. And it depends not only on the masses of the uh, all three neutrino species, but also on the elements of the mixing matrix. So we can get some, in principle, some information about all this quantity from the experiment. Uh, the present uh, upper limits are given here. So that's from our Troitsky and Mines experiment. So we have the square of this effective mass uh, is less than about 2.2 electron volt square. Now there is a very interesting experiment in preparation in Karlsruhe, which is called Katrin, which is supposed to improve this by an order of magnitude, or to find the neutrino mass if it is uh, within this range, at the five sigma level. And in order to do this, one really needs a very good energy resolution, and for this one it's a huge spectrometer, and the spectrometer is so big that it was actually produced near Munich, but to put it to Karlsruhe, which is about 250 kilometers away, there was no way to, to drive it directly. It was so big. So they had to go all the way through the Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea, all this way, and to come here to Karlsruhe, which is very close to this. And, and the road was almost 9,000 kilometers. And you can see the arrival of this spectrometer here you can see how they had to calculate the distance between the houses in order to actually uh, deliver the spectrometer to Karlsruhe. And in one of small cities near Karlsruhe, I was told that they had to dismantle the, the tram line. The, the power cable had to be removed uh, from the tram line in order to bring this spectrometer to Karlsruhe. They didn't damage the houses. <laughs> Sorry? They damaged the No, 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 they didn't damage. So it was a few centimeters, but they calculated, these are Germans, you know, and they calculated them. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mentioned that we still do not know whether neutrinos are Girapo Majorana particles. And the only practical way is uh, to, to learn about this is to study double beta decay. Neutrino is double beta decay. Majorana neutrinos can lead to processes which are characterized by a violation of lepton number by two units. And one of such processes is neutrino double beta decay with no neutrino emission. What is neutrino double beta decay? If the decay of a nucleus with the atomic number A and number of protons Z into the nucleus with one more proton and one less neutron is energetically not allowed, but the transition into the next nucleus with two more protons and two less neutrons is allowed, then in principle we can have decay like this one. 
But for this, we need to, the two neutrons to simultaneously become two protons, two electrons, and, and two antineutrinos, which is, means that this is a process of very high order. It's a second order in big interaction. So it's proportional not to Fermi constant squared, but to Fermi constant to the fourth power. This is an extremely rare process, but it's absolutely obvious that it must exist, and it was actually observed for a number of nuclei experimentally. However, if neutrino is a Majorana particle, it coincides with its own antiparticle. And the neutrino emitted in one of these uh, beta decay processes can be absorbed in the other one. And as a result, we will have a process in which no neutrino is emitted at all. This is only possible if neutrino is a Majorana particle. And this process, uh, if we observe it experimentally, would mean that neutrinos are Majorana particles. The problem is that the neutrino mass is so small, and of course the amplitude of the process is proportional to the neutrino mass, that it's extremely difficult to do that. Experimentalists are working on that with many nuclei, and they have very strong efforts, but up to now there was no positive result except for one claim which was not uh, substantiated by other experiments and which was uh, disputed by many people. So it still remains unclear whether uh, the claim was correct or not. And most likely it was not. Okay. Uh, so the typical diagram which would contribute to neutrinos double beta decay is the following one. A D quark becomes a U quark, two of them. It means a W boson, uh, then two electrons are emitted, and then the neutrino uh, goes into antineutrinos through the Majorana mass term and gets absorbed in the other process. And the amplitude of this process is proportional to uh, the mass sum of the masses of neutrinos times the square of the uh, elements of the leptonic mixing matrix, square of the square of the elements and not of their moduli. This means that the Majorana phases, which I discussed at one of my lectures, give some physical contribution here. So they can lead, for example, to some cancellations of different contributions here and may hide actually the neutrinos double beta decay. So this is the only known example now in which Majorana type CP violated phases can in principle be observed. Okay. So this uh, quantity which is called M beta beta is shown here and sigma 1 and sigma 2 are just this Majorana type CP violated phases. Now of course in many extensions of the standard model there are different mechanisms for the neutrinos double beta decay. Uh, and some of them are shown here, for example, in left right symmetric model, there may be a triplet Higgs, which can be produced here and then emit two leptons. Uh, there may be some lepta quarks, supersymmetric particles. So there are many possibilities for that. And uh, in some of them, you don't see something like a uh, contribution of the Majorana mass here. So the question is, can these process, processes take place without neutrino having a Majorana mass and therefore without neutrino being a Majorana particle? And the answer turns out to be no. There is a very beautiful argument which is uh, uh, due to Schechter and Valle, which is called the black box argument. Whatever mechanism is there, just consider it to be um, depicted by a black box. So we have two uh, D quarks becoming two U quarks. We can write it in this way, put the bar over D quarks and put them in the same direction. Okay? Then the D, anti D and U can annihilate into a W boson, which can interact with the electron, which is also emitted in the double beta decay, and produce the neutrino. And since you, if you just follow the direction of the arrows, which give you the fermion number direction, you'll see that this is just a contribution to the Majorana mass for or electron neutrino. This actually means that whatever mechanism is responsible for the neutrinos double beta decay, even if it's not just direct mechanism in which the Majorana mass appears in the diagram, at some level the Majorana mass will be induced anyway. So if we ever observe neutrinos double beta decay, this would unavoidably mean that neutrinos are Majorana mass. And this is not surprising, actually, because, as I said, this is delta L equal 2 process, which violates lepton number by two units. And this is only possible, uh, as far as I really know, if neutrinos are Majorana particles. 
okay, let me skip this. Some experimental uh, limits and some expectations. This is the claim of Kladdor, which was not substantiated. Uh, sensitivity of future experiments. I'm very sorry I have to rush through this because uh, I want to discuss some other things in more detail. Uh, okay, atmospheric neutrinos. We know that uh, a lot of neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere in this chain of reactions. And typically we have twice as many muon neutrinos as electron neutrinos just because uh, the muon neutrinos are produced in two reactions in this chain. But of course this depends on the energy of neutrinos because sometimes the muon just don't have enough time to decay before they reach the Earth for two big energies. And the oscillations of neutrino, of atmospheric neutrinos were first observed in the super Kamekande experiment, huge voltage Cherenko detector. And uh, this is actually, just look at the left plot. This is the zenith angle dependence of the observed events for electron-like events, for lower energy, for higher energy, and the same for muon-like events. For electron-like events, the electron-like means that the Cherenkov light of the emitted particles is similar to what one expects from electrons. So they identify them with events produced by electron neutrinos, and similarly for muon-like events. Okay? So if you look for muon-like events, that for relatively low energies, zenith angles corresponding to upward going uh, neutrinos. This minus one, cosine theta minus one, means that the neutrinos are coming from the other side of the Earth. Cosine theta zero means that this is uh, horizontally coming neutrinos. And cosine theta plus one are uh, neutrinos coming vertically from the upper direction. So for neutrinos going uh, from uh, the other side of the Earth, we have a relatively strong effect. For neutrinos coming from the um, upper uh, hemisphere, the effect is smaller, the oscillation effect is smaller compared to the expectation direct work here. Uh, but it's still there because neutrinos of low energy still have enough time to oscillate in these cases. However, if we go to higher energies, we see a different picture. Neutrinos coming from, from below us oscillate, and neutrinos coming from horizontal and vertical downgoing that direction don't have enough time. Oscillate. This is exactly what one expects in the case of neutrino oscillations. Okay, let me skip this. And uh, the oscillations of atmospheric neutrinos, which produces some values of delta m square and uh, mixed angle from the analysis of this data, were confirmed directly by the experiments with uh, accelerating neutrinos, which gave uh, the confirmation. This is the plot. Um, of allowed parameters in the um, axis of mixing angle theta 2, 3 and delta m squared 3, 1. This is what was obtained from the accelerator uh, atmospheric ex experiment and this is from the accelerator experiment. They are in a good agreement with each other. Okay, now let me go to solar neutrinos. The solar energy is produced mostly in the hydrogen cycle in which uh, you see the reactions on the cycle here. So, uh, and the bottom line of all these reactions starts with two protons hitting each other, producing deuterium and uh, electron and neutrino. Then P and P reaction, which is similar, except that the electron is on the other side. And then there are some other reactions. And those which are shown in green produce neutrinos. Neutrinos produced in different reactions here, of course, different energy. So we have some complicated spectrum of electron neutrinos produced in the sun. And the overall result of this chain of reaction is that four protons are becoming a, an alpha particle, two electrons are emitted, two neutrinos are emitted, and the 20, about 27 MeV of energy is produced in each of these uh, reaction chains. Okay, so there were a number of experiments in which solar neutrinos were detected. The first one was a, a Holmstake experiment of Davis and collaborators. And then there was Sage and Garrix experiment. All of them were radiochemical experiments in which you irradiate your detector for some time with solar neutrinos. You extract chemically the atoms which are produced as a result of this reaction. And then you count them by allowing them to decay in, in some propulsion counters. That's why the name of radiochemical experiment. That was very low statistics and very difficult experiments. And then there was another way of uh, detecting neutrinos, which was actually Kamehameha, 
and then later super Kamakanda, in which instead of this reaction, neutrino capture on the nucleus, neutrino electron scattering was considered. Uh, this is Kamakanda and super Kamakanda, just new scattering. And finally, there was a Sudbury neutrino observatory experiment in which three different kinds of reactions were studied. Neutrino interaction with neutrons with charge current, so the neutral current, and neutrino electron scattering. Now let me very briefly discuss the results of this experiment. This is actually the spectrum, the predicted spectrum of solar neutrinos. This is logarithmic scale, by the way. I mentioned at my first lecture that we have 60 billion solar neutrinos per square centimeter per second at Earth. These are coming from this flux, so-called PP neutrinos. The other fluxes are smaller. And here I show, I show the energy threshold of different experiments. They were mostly uh, sensitive, the first experiment were mostly sensitive to the high energy part of the spectrum. And this is the summary of the results. OK, so we have here these bars show you the prediction, of theoretical prediction of the expected number of detected neutrinos for chlorine experiment. And different colors show you contribution of different uh, sources of these neutrinos. For example, this blue is uh, boron neutrinos, which are high uh, energy. Small yellow is so-called CNO neutrinos. Then the PP and PEP neutrinos and beryllium-7. This is from electron capture on beryllium-7. So this is what you expect for the Davis experiment, chlorine experiment of Davis. And this is what actually was observed. Only about one circuit there. Of course, there is a question. If we have some discrepancy between the energy and observation, maybe we just predicted the signal of neutrinos from the sun incorrectly. Maybe we just overestimated. How do we know that there is a real problem? And from one experiment, it's impossible to say. However, there are more than one. The next experiment was the super Kamekande and Kamekande experiment, which gave very similar uh, signal, about one half of the predicted signal. And they were only able to measure boron neutrinos. Now, if we have two experiments, the situation is already different. If we know that about only one half of predicted boron neutrinos are produced, then using it here, we'll find that we should have the signal at least at this level, not at this level. So this means that there is no room for neutrinos of other origin here. So this already shows that the miscalculation of fluxes cannot be the reason for the observed deficiency of solar neutrinos. This was dubbed the solar neutrino problem, the deficiency of observed signal of solar neutrinos. Next, there was um, another set of experiments, SAGE, uh, Galaxy and GNO with a different uh, target nuclei, uh, which were able to detect the biggest fraction of neutrinos produced in the sun, the PP neutrinos, and also beryllium 7 neutrinos with high uh, efficiency. And they observed about 60% of the predicted flux. So in different experiments, we see different suppression of the expected signal, which cannot be explained just by simple miscalculation of the overall normalization of different solar neutrino fluxes. But it can be explained if we take, if we assume that neutrinos are converted into some species which cannot be observed in the experiment with the efficiency which depends on neutrino energy. And this is exactly what we expect in the case of the MSW effect. You remember this path top, it's energy dependence of the neutrino survival probability of the sun. So it perfectly well fits into this picture and we can get some prediction for and the predictions in the uh, plane of the mixing angle and delta M square are shown here. Uh, and from the data from uh, different experiments, uh, on this plane are shown by kind of triangles. But these triangles are misplaced with respect to each other. This is from the chlorine experiment, this is from the gallium experiment, and this is from super -planetal. So what is allowed is on the intersection of this diagram. For example, this is so-called small mixing angle solution. There are some uh, large mix and angle solution, and this is a solution which is similar to the vacuum neutrino solutions. And for some time it was not clear which is the true solution, because different experiments seem to prefer different solutions. However, with time, uh, all experimental data started converging to the large mix and angle solution of the uh, MSW effect, uh, of the solar neutrino problem. And um, the final point was put by a reactor neutrino experiment, Kalman, which signaled out this solution and also excluded alternative solutions um, to the solar neutrino problem. 
Okay, I'll skip this. You already have seen. Now the snow detector. Uh, this is a heavy water detector in Canada, and it has measured neutrino fluxes from the sun using three different reactions, as I said. In this one, only electron neutrinos can participate, so it measures how much electron neutrinos are missing in the solar neutrino flux. In this reaction, all neutrinos of different flavors, electron, muon, and tau, participate with the same efficiency. The cross-section, this is the neutral current interaction, and neutral currents are flavor blind. So the cross-section in this case are all the same. And therefore, it gives us information about the total flux of, of neutrinos coming from the sun. And that's extremely important, because we assume we know that some neutrinos are missing. How do we know that they oscillate into something? Maybe they decay, or maybe something else happens. Maybe there's some animal who lives between the sun and the earth who eats neutrinos. Okay? How do we know that neutrinos oscillate? And for this, we need to know that the, what is the value of the total flux of neutrinos coming from the sun. And there was a third reaction in which both neutral current and charge current are involved, and the electron neutrinos at these energies give about six times bigger contribution than neutrinos from, from the flavors. And this is a very interesting plot. Okay. Uh, here is the uh, flux of electron neutrinos measured in different experiments, and this is the sum of the fluxes of muon and tau neutrinos. Now, the chlorine experiment, Brownman, is only sensitive to the electron neutrino flux. Uh, the neutral current experiment is sensitive to the sum of the all three, and the electron scattering is mostly sensitive to the electron neutrinos, but also slightly uh, sensitive to the muon and tau neutrinos. And you see that all three bands from different experiments intersect in the same region. Any two bands would generally intersect in one region, and that's not a big surprise. But now all three of them intersect in one region, and this region corresponds to the non-zero value of muon and tau neutrinos. This is a very beautiful um, consistency check of all the solar neutrino experiments coming from this snow um, collaboration. Okay, I will skip Borexina, maybe just say one or two words about it. Uh, we expect for the solar neutrino survival probably to be curved like this. Okay? And in reality, if we combine the so all solar neutrino experiment, we have something like that, which is not inconsistent, but uh, not uh, very much supporting also the M's double effect, uh, because the errors are so big. Okay. However, uh, the body group, Foley and collaborators, made a very interesting analysis. They analyzed all the data, assuming that we can rescale the M's double potential with some arbitrary factor, A. And they tried to minimize the chi-square in their analysis with respect to this free product. They considered it to be a free product. And if A was found to be zero, this would mean that there is no matter effect on neutrino oscillation. If A is equal to one, this corresponds to the normal MSW effect. And what we found for chi-square is in very good agreement with A equal to one. This was before the recent Borexina data, which actually put some point here, and let me just show it to you. So this was before Borexina, this is with Borexina, and now the agreement becomes even much better. So that's a very strong support for the MSW effect. Okay, let me skip this also, the night effect, uh, reactor neutrino oscillations. Very quickly. Uh, the Survival probability for reactor neutrinos is given by this expression, reactor electron antineutrinos, neutrinos. And we see that two terms here. One corresponds to high frequency oscillation, one with to low frequency oscillation. But the mixing angle here, theta 1, 2, is known to be large. And theta 1, 3, until recently, was unknown at all. We only had an upper limit. So we actually expected to see uh, the curve like this one. And the, all the previous experiments were at uh, at short distances, so they couldn't see any oscillation effects at all. And next, there was a very beautiful experiment, which was called Kanban, in, in Japan, in which people used neutrinos coming from many different atomic power stations, altogether 53 reactor blocks, with average distance, which turned out to be 180 kilometers, which is somewhere here. So they were able to see the oscillation with large frequency, sorry, small frequency and large 
oscillation next, which are responsible for the solar neutrino oscillation. And they actually confirm that the solar neutrino problem is due to this oscillation and measured the corresponding delta M squared with much better accuracy than the solar experiments did. And more recently, uh, this kind of oscillation was found with small amplitude, and this amplitude was given by this, is given by this uh, quantity here, and the parameter theta 1, 3 was actually determined in this way. Okay, so I have almost used my time, so let me go through all these things. Maybe I just show you, uh, this is just the confirmation of the oscillatory nature of, of uh, neutrino deficiency in the Kamat experiment. So we know that neutrinos not only are missing, but they are missing in the correct way, the way which oscillate with distance or over energy. The distance was, of course, fixed, but the energy had some spectrum, and they were able to reconstruct this curve. Okay, let me just go and give you the summary, what we can obtain from the uh, global fit of all the um, oscillation data to the three flavor picture. And this is the summary table taken from the results of the body group. And you see that we know now the small delta m squared, the large delta m squared, and the mixing parameter with incredible accuracy. This is really um, a very high accuracy. We are now in the era of precision measurements in neutrino physics. Okay, now there are some hints that this may not be the full story, that there exists yet another light neutrino species with mass of the order of one electron volt, coming from a number of experiments like mini LSMD, mini boom, and more recently from the Gallium anomaly and the support reactor anomaly. And I don't have time, unfortunately, to discuss all this. Let me just tell you that reactor anomaly, for example, is uh, a result of recent recalculation of the expected flux of neutrinos from the reactor with using the newest data. And you know, the French group which did it came to the conclusion that the spectrum from the reactor should be uh, several percent bigger than what, what we thought it should be. And this can mean that the old reactor experiments have already seen some deficiency of the neutrino signal. And this could be explained if there existed a fourth neutrino, another neutrino species with a mass of the order of one electron. We know that this cannot be a next generation neutrino, because otherwise we would have seen it in the decay of Z-bosons. So this should be a neutrino which has no electronic interaction, which is sterile neutrino. All these hints of the existence, there are many, but all of them are rather weak. There is no single strong hint that there exists a fourth neutrino. But on the other hand, there are many indirect and, and not very strong hints. So we shouldn't dismiss this possibility uh, immediately, we, we should consider it. There may be something um, behind it. And there is a very uh, active experimental program now uh, for studying the possibility of a slight sterile neutrino. Okay, so I'll go through this. So, what we don't know yet about neutrinos, we already learned a lot. But there are things which we still do not know. The main question is, in my mind, whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. And the only known practical way to answer this question is neutrinos double wake the case I mentioned. And there are many experiments which are either underway or in the advanced stage of planning, which should be able to answer this question if neutrinos are quasi-degenerate or uh, the mass hierarchy is invertible. Unfortunately, if we have the normal mass hierarchy, it would be extremely difficult, if possible at all, to see neutrinos double beta decay. And we don't know yet what the hierarchy is. So next question is the absolute mass scale. So we need direct neutrino mass measurements. And double beta decay in cosmology can also tell us something about that. Next question is whether we have normal or inverted hierarchy, or um, whether neutrinos are quasi degenerate. This remains uh, relates to this question. Um, there are some ideas how to do that, and there are some experiments working on that. Again, I don't have much time to discuss it. Uh, what is CP violation in the electronic sector? What is the value of the CP violating phase? And the next generation of long baseline accelerator experiments is supposed to answer this question. Uh, 
Are there Majorana type CP YG phases and do they uh, affect double beta decay? Again, these experiments should be able to answer this question. And finally, if there is uh, a light cell neutrino and there's um, experimental efforts in this direction, we would also like to see directly some effects of, of the matter of neutrino oscillation, like MSW resonance of the parametric resonance of neutrino oscillations. We would like to improve the accuracy of the determination of the parameters which we already know, uh, improve our knowledge of the solar energy production by studying better uh, the spectrum of the solar neutrinos, uh, studying matter dominated to vacuum dominated transition of solar neutrinos. This is a gap which is not studied yet in the spectrum of the solar neutrinos. And, and study uh, the non-standard neutrino interaction, neutrino magnetic moment. So there are some ideas of mass varying neutrinos, some very exotic ideas and uh, possible subdominance effects uh, for solar atmospheric and accelerator experiments. On the theory side, of course, we want to understand what is behind the structure of neutrino mass matrices, what is the underlying theory of, of neutrino mass. And we would like to study some exotic possibilities like uh, Lorentz invariance violation, CPT violation, non standard interaction uh, in neutrinos. And there are some other ideas which are by far more exotic, like neutrino tomography of the Earth, or mass power effect with neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos, there are some even very, very exotic papers on extragalactic communication with neutrinos or communication uh, with the submarines using neutrinos. Uh, that's I would really put into exotics. Yeah? Earth earthquake prediction. Maybe. And uh, what is behind the smallness of the neutrinos? There are many models to explain the structure of the neutrino mass matrix. Uh, unfortunately, there is no clear leader among them. So we still uh, do not know what is the physics behind the uh, generation of the neutrino mass and which explains actually the structure of the neutrino mass matrix. Uh, there are still some interesting questions to be answered. Uh, and. Uh, the ultimate goal, as I said, is to unravel physics underlying neutrino mass generation, and one can expect new interesting, very new interesting results from neutrino physics in the near future, and probably also new surprises. So the neutrino revolution continues. Thank you. Questions, please. conventional scenario is that neutrinos play very little or no role in, in dark matter. Uh, the usual neutrinos cannot play any important role. A long time ago there was idea that neutrinos can be warm dark matter. However, there are some uh, different scenarios in which we have a KV scale sterile neutrino. In this case it can play a role of dark matter. This is being uh, developed by Shamashin and his collaborators. More questions? Thank you again for the whole